to homegrown Nazis in the land of the free, the German-American born in 1930s America. Thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Isabella Rowan. A lot of you probably know that already. Um, but I am the program coordinator here at Delray Beach Public Library. Tonight's special event is part of a series of programs that are being presented in conjunction with the Americans and the Holocaust exhibition. Have you all had a chance to see it yet? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So as you know, uh, we are one of 50 libraries selected across the United States to host this traveling exhibit. It was offered by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington and the American Library Association. It closes here on November 17th, so there are only like nine days left. So if you haven't told your friends and neighbors and loved ones to come and check it out, please do so. As you know, because you've seen it, through historical images and text from original sources, this interactive exhibit examines the motives, pressures, and fears that shaped Americans' responses to Nazism, war, and genocide from 1933 to 1945. Now, even though we are starting to wind up the exhibition schedule, there are still some excellent programs coming up. Tomorrow night on Zoom, so you can stay home and be cozy, um, we have author, professor, and historian Jeffrey H. Jackson. He is an expert on European history and culture who teaches at Rhodes College. He is going to talk about the little known story in his book that's entitled Paper Bullets. The story goes, from 1940 to 1944, Two gutsy French women executed an audacious anti-Nazi campaign to undermine the German troops occupying their home, the British Channel Island of Jersey. Drawing on their avant-garde background, they wrote and distributed paper bullets, wicked insults against Hitler, calls to rebel, and subversive fictional dialogues that amounted to their own PSYOPs campaign. They slipped these little paper bullets into soldiers' pockets, left them on the windshields of military vehicles, and tucked them inside newsstand magazines. So the book, Paper Bullets, is available for checkout here with your library card, and it is also available to pick up your own copy from the Murder on the Beach bookstore, which is our partner right here on the corner. The event is at 7 o'clock tomorrow, and it's on Zoom, and you can still register. The next Zoom event is on Wednesday, the day after tomorrow, and it's also at 7 p.m. And it's called the World War, World War II and the Diverse Lives of America's Fathers. And it examines the impact of World War II on fatherhood and the American family. Many of us have personal memories of our fathers and grandfathers who came home from the war. How did their experiences affect your family? And what about the families whose dads never came home? And what about the impact of forced internment on Japanese families and fathers? Or the African American families whose brave soldier dads were discriminated against and didn't receive the honors or benefits that they deserved? This will be a fascinating look at fatherhood. Presented on Zoom by Ralph LaRossa, PhD, Professor Emeritus of Sociology at Georgia State University. It's gonna be a good program and I hope you can join us on Zoom, not here. You can see the full schedule of all of our upcoming Holocaust programs on our website. They're all free. All you have to do is sign up. So funding for and other support for our Americans in the Holocaust programs have been provided by Menon, Dr. Regine Bataille, Temple Sinai of Palm Beach, the Women's National Book Association of South Florida chapter, the Delray Beach Historical Society, the National Council of Jewish Women Palm Beach, and the school district of Palm Beach County. And we thank all of those organizations for supporting the library. And I thank all of you for supporting the library by being here tonight. Tonight's lecture is a fact-filled, fascinating look at the history of the German-American Bund that was alive and well right here in the United States in the 30s. Elliot Kopp earned an MA in history from Florida Atlantic University. His master's thesis is titled Fritz Kuhn, the American Fuhrer and the Rise and Fall of the German-American Bund. He teaches law and speech and debate to middle school students in Broward County. Let's give a warm welcome to Elliot Kopp.
Thank you, thank you. Um, I did have my booster shot, so I'm going to take this off right now. You should be okay. Um, I want to thank uh, Isabella for, uh, I consider it a real honor to be here tonight. Uh, I came with my son, Oriel, uh, to spend a little bit of time with you uh, about this topic, the German-American boom. Not, uh, not too many people know about the German-American boom. Um, but they were a pretty big deal in the 1930s. Um, I have been a teacher for well over 20 years, and um, my comfort zone is in having a conversation. Uh, so rather than have me drone on, and then you ask the questions afterwards, I want you to feel comfortable as I'm moving along to raise your hand, ask a question, and that way you don't have to wait through the whole thing to ask a question that you might forget. If I know the answer to the question, I will certainly answer it. And if I don't, uh, then I'll make something up. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Okay, so, um, uh, am I, the mic? Oh, am I not loud enough? Uh, is that? He's asking if you can use the mic. Can you just pick it up? Would you prefer I use the mic? Yeah. Okay, all right. In my classes, they, encourage me not to use the mic because I tend to be very loud, but that's fine. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, very good. Okay, so uh, we're going to be talking about Fritz Kuhn and the German-American boom. I wanted to start with a couple of tunes that um, were big back in the day in Nazi Germany and uh, were adopted by the German-American boom. One is Deutsch Landlied, the Song of Germany, which is basically the national anthem, and the true national anthem of Nazi Germany, the Horst Wessel Lied. Horst uh, Wessel was uh, a guy who was in uh, 1923 in the Bear Hole Push, in which Hitler tried to take power in Munich, and he got killed. And he, they created a song uh, so that they can kind of worship the guy every year. So let me go ahead and put this on for you right now. This is Deutschland, Deutschland, Uberalis. And these songs were played uh, at every German-American boomed gathering. <clears throat> it's not on long, But it, it gives you a sense of uh, how Nazis have carried over. This is the Horst Wessel lead song right here. Okay, um, we're going to move on now. We have a very rare film, uh, at least until recently. In 1939, on February 20th, George Washington's birthday celebration, uh, members of the German-American Boon held a huge, huge rally. And in this rally, um, a good 20,000 dues-paying members showed up. It was really the zenith of the German-American Boon's influence. Uh, and of all places, Madison Square Garden. I mean, when we think of Madison Square Garden, we think of, you know, the bastion of American free enterprise and boxing matches and uh, Elvis. Uh, but they held this right there in New York City. So I'm going to play, uh, if I can ask your patience, it's about five to six minutes, but it's well worth it. It's very, very interesting.
The whole thing. And you're going to hear Fritz Kuhn talk in a, in a bit.
speechless. And uh, when I said I wanted to have a conversation, this is as good a time as any. Um, what do you? I mean, what do you guys think of that in terms of allowing something like that to occur in, in a bastion of, of uh, Judaism? I mean, it's New York City. Does anybody have any opinions about that, or what would you say? I'm amazed that our government allowed this gathering. I don't understand. And then they come on and they sing our anthem? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, they cut that part out, but uh, Fritz Kuhn refers to President Roosevelt as Franklin D. Rosenfeld during his speech. Um, it's, it's an outrage, but if you're living in a country with a constitution that allows freedom of speech, you can't pick and choose. Um, you got to take the good with the bad. Yeah. The Japanese were put in, uh, the, uh, the Japanese were put in camps during the war. Well, why not them? What was the justification of not putting them away? Uh, they didn't look foreign. <laughs> the Japanese looked Japanese, and I, I think that was probably the reason why. During the Second War, the Japanese, Italians, and Europe were the most highly decorated units. Absolutely. Absolutely, and you're right. I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Once again, freedom of speech, as long as they are not in there hurting somebody, but to do it in the midst of one of the most Jewish cities in the world is just an outrage. I think everybody would agree to that. Yeah. I think it leads me to believe that they felt comfortable enough to do this because they were higher ups within our government who also align themselves with their beliefs. So I feel that they felt that they could get away with this and do it. Could you repeat what you said? Yeah, uh, that they could get away with it because there were higher ups in the government who, uh, I guess, uh, were em uh, sympathetic to the cause of the uh, German American movement. And that may well be. That may well be. Yeah, go ahead. So, but it's not that different today. Number one. Number two, you couldn't do that in Germany. Today, you couldn't do that in Germany, as far as I know. Now, is it a democracy? It's a democracy, but they don't know the Constitution. Is that where we're so lucky that we have the First Amendment? Which I, which I would fight for. But they won't allow it there. See, this is the reason why I want to have a conversation and not just drone on myself and just wait for quick. These are great things you guys are saying. Definitely food for thought. Definitely food for thought. Um, let's talk a little bit about the German-American boon, the origin of the German-American boon. Yes, sir. Yeah, what does Bund mean? Is it a German word for something? Or? Yeah, Bund is uh, more or less like an more or less like an organization or things falling off here. Like a federation, I guess you'd say. German-American federation. Um, they adopted everything uh, from a German perspective. Even the name German-American Boone instead of German-American club, German-American organization. And it gets back to what I'm about to say right now, which is um, the origins. The folks who came over here from Germany were the, uh, the disaffected, uh, some were quite frankly losers, uh, World War I, Germany had been defeated, uh, the financial uh, areas within Germany fell apart, uh, many of these folks had nothing, and they emigrated to the United States. And they brought with them uh, their culture, their society. So we see that there are several of these um, societies the student society, Society of Teutonia, which becomes the most important, uh, and Gao USA. And so, what they all had in common, what do you think they all had in common besides the German background? What do you think all of these uh, organizations and the people in them, for the most part, had in common? For the most part. <laughs> but you know the answer. Go ahead. Anti-Semitic, anti-Semitism. It was the drawing card that brought many of these German citizens to these organizations or these, these groups, these fellowships. 
if you will. And as time went on, there was a lot of interfighting, internecine war that went on, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second here. The leaders. Okay. Now you don't necessarily need to know uh, the names because ultimately Fritz Kuhn uh, is the guy uh, that we're going to be getting to um, who really grew the German-American boom. But these were sort of the forerunners. Uh, Fritz and Peter Gissable, rhymes with Kissable, um, were the leaders of Teutonia. And the mission of Teutonia really was to raise awareness of the German culture and the languages we spoke about, but also to raise money for the NSDAP, which was the Nazi organization, because the Nazis hadn't come to power yet. And so uh, Fritz especially um, took a leadership role and started to grow Teutonia. And it kind of took on a darker mode, if you will, um, they started to be sort of, S are you guys familiar with the SA in Nazi Germany? They were like the thugs that helped Hitler gain power. Well, Teutonia became like the SA. They were uh, breaking windows and beating up people, uh, particularly those, uh, you know, uh, Jewish people that got, happened to get in the way. And it, it caused a lot of problems. Heinz Spanknobel, he and Gisibel were partners, and, um, and because they were sending money to these Nazi organizations in, um, in Germany, uh, they both got in trouble with the government and were going to be uh, sent out. And uh, before Spanknobel had a chance to be thrown out of the country, he got out on his own, uh, which left uh, Gisibel in charge. Now this guy is very interesting, Walter Kapp. Walter Kapp was another person who was involved with Teutonia. What's interesting about Walter Kapp is he became um, second in command to Fritz Kuhn. But what's really interesting about him is he, Fritz Kuhn threw him out of the organization. He left, went back to Germany, and after the war had started, set up a program of U-2, of U-boats, um, attacking the United States. And there is a famous story of a raft of German military guys who went, came to Florida, a U-boat dropped them off, they went on rafts, and they got caught because one of their own, you know, reported on them. But it was Walter Cap that put that whole program together. So I, I just think that that's really, really interesting. And there's the man himself, Fritz Julius Kuhn. Fritz Kuhn, you know, say what you will about the guy. And quite frankly, it's the whole basis of, of my thesis. If it were not for Fritz Kuhn, um, I don't know that the German-American boom would have survived, it would have fallen apart like Gao USA uh, and like Teutonia eventually did. And uh, this was a guy who knew his marketing. This is a guy who knew his advertising. He was skilled, he was a skilled leader. He's the gentleman that you saw talking. Gentleman, I use that, use that term loosely. Uh, you saw him talking in Madison Square Garden. Okay, so you might recognize uh, Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hess was Adolf Hitler's right-hand flunky, if you will. And um, basically what happened was that, and most people don't really realize this, so they don't think about it. In the early to mid-1930s, many Americans, a great number of Americans, really had no opinion about Nazism and Hitler. Hitler, if you aren't Jewish. It's sort of a, you know, they were worried about their own problems and you can take it or leave it type of thing. So in Hitler's mind, this was an opportunity to convince Americans that there was something good about Nazism. 
Okay, and we're talking now, you know, mid-30s, 36. And uh, so Rudolf Hess, what's that? Question? I'm so sorry, I don't. No, no, that's fine. Rudolf Hess uh, gave the okay for um, the folks at Teutonia to start a new organization. Okay? And that new organization, let's get to it over here. The Friends of New Germany, otherwise known as FOB. And uh, Heinz Spanknobel was chosen as the leader. And the point of the Friends of New Germany, I mean, you can just hear the words, Friends of New Germany, was to convince Americans that they should um, put aside any preconceived notions about Nazism and become friendly in terms of uh, countries being friends with each other. Um, and, you know, the fact of the matter is that many of, uh, many Americans I mean, you could see in Madison Square Garden, those were not German nationals. Those were Americans of German nationality. Question? I still find it difficult to believe that they could get such a tremendous turnout there. Well, didn't they have to get permits? Like, when they wanted to do a march in Spokane, they didn't allow it. Wasn't the mayor of New York allowed to make politicians for Jewish organizations? Have they allowed this? It's a great, I mean, deep, great questions, and I love it. And the answer is they were allowed to because if you're looking at it from the perspective of the times, uh, you know, I, if, if you're Jewish, you kind of know that anti-Semitism has always existed throughout the centuries in one form or another. And so certain governments, and the American government too, tended to turn a blind eye to things of this nature. Um, you know, uh, President Roosevelt turned the St. Louis around. Everybody knows that. I mean, not everybody, but most people who are aware of this stuff. They tended to turn a blind eye towards it. Uh, it was, I don't know if it was the fact that they were Jews or they just didn't want another problem to deal with. Uh, but at some level, there's always a certain, uh, you know, I, I read a book years ago, and uh, it was called They Hated the Jews. And I looked through it, and it had like, with the exception of like Winston Churchill, every leader going back to Alexander the Great had a problem with the Jews, for some reason or another. And I think that that's kind of continued. I mean, I'm Jewish, and I, I've, I moved to Louisville, Kentucky, I'm 60 now, but when I was like 12, I moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and I received a lot of uh, anti-Semitic, uh, you know, feedback, and um, sometimes you just can't get away with it. And somebody made the point, I think you made the point, that the higher-ups in the government, uh, you know, kind of a wink and a nod. I, I mean, I would have to agree with you. I would, you know, Franklin Roosevelt was not an anti-Semite, not by any stretch of the imagination, but he tended to turn a blind eye, whereas Eleanor, on the other hand, she took a stand. She took a stand. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt took a stand for the Jews. Franklin was like, eh, mm, mm, you know, until until the war started, it was obvious what was going on. And some of his advisors, Cordell Hill. Cordell absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. I know there were more German immigrants in this country than any other nationality or more German heritage, especially in the 19th century, but were people who've been in this country generations part of this also? It's interesting, and I'm going to show you a video of, um, of uh, German-American boom folks who wanted to buy some property, and they filmed the reaction of the citizens of this hamlet, this town. And they start off by saying, our remarks are not geared towards what they would call the old-time Germans. In other words, the ones that had been there for a while. But the, this new breed of Germans who had come in with the idea that um, they're going to take over and they're going to turn this into a Jew-free society. And another way that they would do that is by linking, linking the communists 
with the Jews. You know, the communism is always a, a big thing. And we'll see a little bit more about that. But as far as the Germans that lived here for, for many years, that was not where the beef was at. The beef was in, was in with the folks who are coming in now and saying, we want a Jew-free country. You know, we want, I mean, you heard what uh, Kuhn said. You know, exactly, exactly everything you'd expect from a rabid anti-Semite. And so that's really, really what they were dealing with. Um, okay, so Rudolf has, uh, has authorized uh, this new uh, organization, and it took the gals and Teutonia and whittled it all down to this new Friends of New Germany. Question, ma'am. I have a question. I was just going to say, in, with regard to what that woman said, she was so shocked. I feel the same thing can happen, a program like that can happen right now mm -hmm. in New York. That many people would be there and the government would allow it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, who's to say? You're probably right. Um, I, I would say you're more right than not. I mean, who's to say? But once again, when you live in, in a country that allows rights for some people, they have to allow rights for all people. You know, you can't pick and choose. You can't pick and choose. And, uh, you know, we talk about the thing with Skokie and all that. If there is a guarantee of violence, in other words, if I were, you know, it's the type of thing where somebody, like my students come on, they say to me, um, uh, I can say this, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. No, you don't have freedom of speech. It's limited. So if I'm going to go into, let's say I go to, uh, and, and we'll just say an African-American area. Charlottesville, Virginia. What's that? Charlottesville, Virginia. Oh, sure, right. And, and I say something that I know is guaranteed to cause violence. Like, God forbid, I go to uh, some place that's called Martin Luther King Boulevard and I shed out the N-word, okay? That's not freedom of speech. I'm not allowed to do that. Because I'm guaranteed, there's guaranteed to be something bad that's going to come out of that. It's the same thing as being in a movie. It's, it's the same thing as being in a movie theater and shouting fire. Right? Oh, is that what you just said? You got me. Good for you. You can't do it. Okay, there are limits to freedom of speech. Now, with that said, the Madison Square Garden event, no one was, you know, it's, they, they were words. They were words. But nobody was hurting anybody. Nobody was causing it. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the man that went in there, Isidore uh, Greenbaum, Greenbaum or Greenberg, um, I, I got to tell you, that's gutsy. That is gutsy. Uh, you got to respect that, man. You know, when you go into a Madison Square Garden, or when you go into that arena with 20,000 Nazis and you rush the stage, I mean, that guy was an unsung hero. As a matter of fact, I think Life magazine did a whole write up on him. Uh, pretty amazing stuff. He survived? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he survived. Yeah. He, they, they put him in jail, and I think he got out the same night. Sir. <clears throat> the real big picture arose out of World War I, when the Nazis, the Germans, but they were defeated. But years later, with the Versailles Treaty, it was very punitive on Germany. It was. Germany was a ruin. There, there were people begging in the streets. And that arose a tremendous dissatisfaction with anything non-German. And these people that came over from Germany had this intense reason to be nationalistic. They wanted Germany to rise again, and by creating an American boon, they figured they could have like a fifth column here. Fifth column, absolutely. Where Germany itself was in ruin. Absolutely correct. That's how the Nazis came to power. And I'd like to add something to that. The trope, yes, World War I devastated Germany, and it caused a, a, a really a domino effect. But what's the trope that goes along with that? Who caused the defeat of World War I? The trope is the Jews did. It was, it was an inside job. It was our Jews, the so-called German Jews, that caused the problems. And that is where it carried over like, to the United States. These disaffected Germans come over, they blame the Jews. Now they're in the United States of America where there are more Jews than any other country in the world, um, even at that time, you know, Israel didn't have that many Jews relative to the United States. 
And so it was the Jews' fault. This gave them every opportunity to take out their anger and blame. It, it just gave every opportunity to do that. But you're absolutely right, sir. That's exactly right. The fifth power, you're right about that. Thank you for that. Um, October 1933, we said Heinz uh, Spank Noble was deported because he did not register as a foreign agent because what were they doing in Fon? They were sending money out to Hitler, to the Nazis. And he did not register. He was gone. In December 1935, Hitler said, you know, these people uh, in this Fon are more trouble than they're worth. They're not really, they're thugs. I mean, even he had to admit that. They're thugs. They're not making us look very good here. I'm putting this edict out. I want all leaders and German nationals, any members who are German nationals of this Fon, they are no longer members of that, and they need to leave and come back to the United, uh, to Germany, uh, or they will lose their German citizenship. Because even in 1935, Hitler still had a hope that you know, Nazi Germany could still look good in the eyes of the United States, even, you know, as far as 1935. And really, until Kristallnacht in uh, November, as a matter of fact, is today the... Hey, hey, tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow the 10th, 1938. Um, you, you still had, you still had, yeah, Night of Broken Glass, um, the government sanction of the destruction of the Jews really started at that point. Um, so Hess disbanded and all those associated with Fon went back to Germany. And this is the, uh, I was telling you, <clears throat> where uh, Cap planned the, uh, the saboteurs to come from the U-boats. That's an article from 1942. Okay, and so now we're going to go into the golden age of the German boon, which is when Fritz Kuhn took over in 1936. And really, that's what my thesis is about. That's the whole point of the thesis, is to say that he created a golden age. But for his insights and the work he did, it probably would have fallen apart, which quite frankly would have been a wonderful thing. But it is what it is. Any questions? Any questions about anything so far? Once again, I want this to be a conversation. I, I don't want to you know, drone on here. I want to get some feedback from you folks. I've been hearing some good stuff, some really good stuff from you folks. Yes, sir. In the United States at that time, it's very easy for people to be uh, sympathetic to anti-Semitic views. Think about Henry Ford, which a lot of you know. It was an anti-Semite published newspaper guy. Think about Father Coughlin. Think about that here in Boca, you know, that there was a sign that said Jews and dogs not allowed into the 1950s. Uh, think about a lot of the ads that were in newspapers that really just said for Christian, not Jews. It, it was really permeating, not just in the United States, all over the world. And uh, just look at the other nations that during the war that was conquered by the Nazis, where there was a tremendous amount of people that helped the Nazis. Um, glad. So it's something to really think about at those times, anti-Semitism was relatively accepted on the, on the surface pretty much. And somebody mentioned uh, about today, you, know, you look at today with the anti-Semitism that is all around us right now. You know, we thought it was an import from Europe. From, uh, Europe. Not really. It's been here all the time. Under the surface, and sometimes now with the recent violent attacks that we've experienced here in the United States, it's on the surface. So you shouldn't be surprised that in the United States it was something that was looked upon, or looked, the people looked askance. and said, okay, fine, the Nazis are doing their thing, we're going to move on, because we were isolationists. We did not want to get involved in what was happening in Europe at all, in both wars. It took us a while to get involved in the war, as, as you all know. So it, it's something to really think about in reference to what you're talking about before. Absolutely. I, I do have a question for you. Though. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
there were rumors, or some some people corroborated this, that Errol Flynn and uh, let's see who else, Charles Lindbergh, were supporters of the movement. So I don't know if, if your research took you in that direction. Well, it did. Um, the Errol Flynn one. Um, remember, I told you that if I know the answer, I make it up. Uh, here's where I'm going to make that up. Yeah, you're right. No, I don't know about Errol Flynn, but absolutely, Charles Lindbergh, well known, well known uh, anti-Semite, uh, gave money to the to the Boone. Um, Father Charles Coghlan uh, was, and this guy had a radio show on for 40 years, 1926 to 1966, and he was a rabid, rabid anti-Semite, put out, and we're gonna be talking about him, and then you mentioned Ford, who went out of his way to republish the protocols of the elders of Zion, and if you know what that is, that was published in um, uh, Tsarist times, in Tsarist Russia, and it's about, uh, a group of rabbis, a uh, cabal of rabbis, cabal rather, cabal of rabbis, uh, who are going to take over the world and infiltrate different areas. So, yeah, I mean, I it's it's always there. Sometimes, I mean, we see uh, we see anti-Semitism worse when times are were are bad. You know, then it tends to come out much more than when people are. You know, things are going fairly well. But you're right, it's, it's just always under the surface. And it's not being, you know, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean people aren't talking about me behind my back, okay? It's always underneath the, uh, underneath the surface. Okay, let's see here, the Coon years. Uh, March 1936 to December 1939. Uh, and here we have some pictures, and of course the backdrop Oh yeah, you got your you got your American flag back there, uh, and then you have uh, the German American boot. It's not a swastika, but if you look at it, it's it's almost like an SS thunderbolt, like a death head thunderbolt, and uh, he's wearing his uh, pseudo Nazi uh, uniform, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay, so Fritz Kuhn is now in power, it's now 1936. So he says, hmm, who can I get that's going to help me consolidate my power and kind of back me up and uh, let people know that I'm in charge? Anybody want to have a guess? Anybody care to take a guess? Pretty obvious. Go ahead. McDonald's? Oh, what is that? <laughs> I, I never knew that. No, no, not McDonald's. Uh, somebody uh, a little bit more powerful than Ray Kroc. <laughs> Adolf Hitler. In August of 1936, during the Berlin Olympics, uh, Fritz Kuhn and his guys traveled and actually got a meeting with Adolf Hitler and uh, provided Hitler with some, uh, some books with, with uh, cutouts and a whole bunch of different uh, uh, stuff that Hitler would never look at again. And Hitler said to Kuhn something to the effect of, um, Go back and win the fight. Kuhn took that to mean that Hitler backed him and the movement. Go back, go back and continue the fight. And that is what he used to keep power. Now, years later, um, when the boom was having all kinds of trouble, this was reported to Hitler. Hitler didn't even remember who the guy was. And he, sa he said, Basically, what he said was, I, you know, I need a lot of people. <laughs> you know, I tell them a lot of things. It really meant nothing to him. Yes. <laughs> and um, Fritz Kuhn used that to, and he uh, took advantage of those words and used it for himself any way he wanted to. So he doesn't watch cartoons at home. <laughs> <laughs> Learns about the German American. <laughs> That's correct. Yes, sir. That is correct. Yeah, so he, he used those few words of Hitler. Quite frankly, uh, Hitler was 
disgusted by the German American boom because it was a, it was basically a knockoff. They weren't doing anything. You know, they had their thugs and they really didn't add to the Nazi mystique. And uh, you know, Hitler didn't want anything to do with them, quite frankly. Paying homage to the source. Okay, and of course, um, every good businessman must have a mission statement for his his or her business businessman business person. Excuse me, business person for his or her business. Does somebody have a question over here? Yes, ma'am. When did Fritz Kuhn come to the U.S.? Say again. When did Fritz Kuhn come to the U.S.? Fritz Kuhn first got here in 1924. 1924. Yes. And question. Okay, um, and he worked in Detroit as, um, he worked for Ford Motor Company, actually, <laughs> as, as it would work out. Um, and um, he, he was given, uh, he became a naturalized citizen uh, in the early, I believe, 1934. And being a naturalized citizen uh, gave him the opportunity to uh, encourage others as to the benefits of becoming a naturalized citizen. And so he produced this, Awake and Act, Aims and Purposes of the German-American Boom. Okay, I don't know if it's gonna be easy for you to see, but there are some really, really interesting concepts in here if you read it, it is, it's like a hodgepodge of uh, Americanism and a Nazi belief system. So if you look at number one, above all, to uphold and defend the Constitution, incidentally, the Constitution should be a capital C, uh, and the laws of the United States of America. But then again, if you go down to five, to defend with all lawful means at our disposal the good name and honor of our mother country, country Germany against all base defamation, willful and poisonous lies and purposeful malice emanating from any ill-wishing, jealous, avaricious and ignorant source, whoever, be it race, people, no, what you need to read here would be a Jew, 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 Jew. That's really what he's talking about here. You know, that's really what he's talking about here. Uh, <clears throat> any questions? Yes, go ahead. So what was the other German people who weren't involved in this, who thought that this was a horrific movement, what were they doing? And what were the churches of the German people saying during this time? Exactly what you said. It's horrible. It's terrible. We want nothing to do with it. There have been many American uh, Germans, uh, Americans of German heritage, who were invited to join. Because if you think about it, there were, would you say, millions of uh, German Americans in the United States, yeah. and there was never, at any time, even at the zenith, there was never any more than twenty thousand dues-paying. German American boom members. So most uh, most of the churches, if you're not taking like Father Coughlin into account, rejected it out of hand. Rejected it out of hand, as most people did. You see, you have to realize something. The reason that you really haven't heard, or too many people have heard about the German American boom, is because it was on the French. It, it really had no impact politically, socially, economically, philosophically. It really didn't have that much of an impact. And this is kind of like a side note to history. It existed. And it's here to learn about. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I don't think that's true, actually. I'm sorry? I don't think that's true, actually. Which part? that it didn't have an impact on society and the Jews in this country. I mean, I know my father changed his name at that period of time, and he went to the war because of uh, the anti-Semitism. Well, I'm not talking about anti-Semitism. No, but it was front and center. 
not not necessarily good per se. But well, it's not talking about the boom. Yeah, but I'm just saying. But you said the impact of the anti-Semitic. No, no, you misunderstood. I'm talking about the boom. Right, but you said it didn't have, and I think that had an overlap to the anti-Semitism that was permeating, permeating okay. across. Okay. But right? you didn't live that. I didn't live that. No, but my uh, grandfather did, and uh, my, my grandfather actually saw them in the streets. It's and a statistic about how many Jews changed their names during this period. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely true, but uh, I think that that had to do with anti-Semitism countrywide. The boon itself, the 20,000 members, I don't think, changed anybody's behavior. I understand what you're saying, and I, and I get it. It's just part of the... It's part of the whole. Absolutely. So, I stand corrected. It yeah. is part of the whole. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. To be and remain worthy of our Germanic blood, our German fatherland, our German brothers and sisters, who are now fighting for their very existence and honor to cultivate our German language customs and ideals. And then, to always remember that only in unity is strength, and that, if firmly united, we will then be of real value and a desirable and respected class of law-abiding citizens of the United States of America. So, it's sort of a mix and match situation here. You know, it's two loyalties, as it were. Okay, I, I, I put this in there because I did want to show you, uh, as a matter of fact, we call it Nazi knockoffs. Um, I don't know, quite frankly, what Fritz Kuhn was modeling his clothing, you know, on. Maybe uh, he thought that this is what the uh, SA was wearing or something. This really, really is a knockoff because it, it doesn't resemble uh, Nazi uniforms. I mean, it, look, you look at it you quickly, you say, oh, that's, you know, that's a Nazi. But it really doesn't resemble the Nazi uniforms at all. Uh, the signal, of course, the, uh, the sign, of course, could be interpreted as a Nazi, right? Nazi swastika, but yet, no, you know, it's a, it's a thunderbolt. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, once again, there's a, well, actually, you're right, but that's a, that's camp clothing. But we're going to talk about the summer camps right now. Oh, the summer camps. You would believe they had so much fun. The summer camps. We'll talk about that. Um, what I do want to say is, Fritz Kuhn, um, as a leader, was. Um, was actually very good at what he did. He started many organ, uh, many, um, say this, uh, many organizations within the boon to help boon members. The German American Business League helped boon members to start their own businesses. American Volksboon Development Corporation helped boon members to purchase land. Uh, that's how they got the land for the um, camps. For the side. You know, I hate saying camps because of the, you know, what it puts in your head. The, the summer camps. Um, I'm going to make sure it's a summer camps. Uh, the American Volksboon, the publishing company, they actually published their own newspaper. You could go down the streets of New York in 1937, 1938, and, and purchase one of their newspapers. Um, the Deutsche Rekruf und Beobachter. Were they published in German? They were published in German. They were published in German and they had English translations as well. Uh, the Prospective Citizens League bring in, we were talking about, you know, the quote unquote good Germans, the ones that didn't get involved with this. The, the Prospective Citizens League was to go out there and find. Americans of German heritage. Because remember, the big switch, all those other organizations that we talked about, the early ones, the Gal, they were German citizens. The, 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 I hate to use the word brilliance, but the concept that Kuhn wanted was to bring Germans, Americans in, of German heritage, citizens of the United States that can use that to their benefit. German American Settlement League, Germans who have come over to the United States to help them find a place. 
German American Boom Auxiliary to raise money for uh, you know for the boom. German American Vocational to help find jobs, and the always popular German American Jugendschaft, just like the Hitler Youth. You've all heard of the Hitler Youth. Well, guess what? The German American Boom did the same thing. They had their youth groups, and that was part of the summer camp. The Boom established several summer training camps, upwards of 16 by 1939. Uh, now, I'm guessing that some of you are from the Northeast, perhaps, New Jersey, New York, uh, Pennsylvania, and, um, and there were camps there. You can still see remnants of them now if you go there. They had street signs, Adolf Hitler Boulevard, you know? Herman Goldring Avenue, uh, Camp uh, Nordland in New Jersey, Camp Siegfried in Yapheim, New York, Camp Hindenburg in Grafton, Wisconsin, Deutsch Forest Country Club, Country Club, uh, Camp Bergwald in Bloomingdale, New Jersey, Camp Highland in Wyndham. This is just a small sampling, just a small sampling. And now I'd like to show you uh, a little bit of these young people in the camp. There we go. Um, now there's actually music. It's like fun. <laughs> yeah, well there's very, very uh, good music that goes with it. I don't know why it's not playing. It's very haunting. That's okay. Now the thing about these camps were they were not limited to children. Families literally saved up during the year and went to these camps and uh, and had a vacation. <laughs> and they had everything that you can think of in uh, you know in upstate New York. We used to go to uh, I think it was called the Neville. Yeah. You guys remember the Neville Hotel? Castle. Yeah, Castle, yeah. Yeah, well, this is their Nivoli Hotel. <laughs> right? So, yeah, in uh, Lake Mohawk, in Spot in New Jersey, there was a very active boom. And years later, obviously, we went up there. It was a very pretty lake area. And they still had uh, two or three Germanic type restaurants. And they literally, in October, they went crazy over Oktoberfest. October, yeah. So it was still a very dramatic type area. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Was the great center in New York? I'm sorry? Was the center of the boom in New York? Yes. Yes. The headquarters were in New York. Um, so you get the idea there. Um, Camp Nordland uh, opened up in July 1937. The daily regime, now if you were to look at the regiment at the Boone Camp, it would look very much like any regiment that you would see. I mean, if you look, the, you know, you got your breakfast, you clean your tents. What they don't tell you, um, and which I learned from uh, I didn't mention this, but um, I was able to get primary documentation uh, through the Freedom of Information Act, National Archives, and they sent boxes and boxes of primary, I mean, stuff that was literally typed out in the 1930s. Um, I also got, uh, my, I, I came here in a roundabout way uh, through my brother, Dr. David Copies, a professor at Barry University, and both he and I were interested in this in this topic. Uh, we were able to purchase uh, from an author named Marvin Miller, uh, also just boxes of um, primary documentation that he used to write a book about the camp called Wonderlick's Salute. So just and then we went ahead. Um, we gave all of that stuff over to Barry University for their archives after we were done with it. Uh, but my point being, what they don't tell you here is the indoctrination that went on. This all looks, hey, you know, wow, 
Look at all the stuff, good stuff here. Instruction in the German language, singing German songs. In the, in the primary documentation that I have, it discusses, they interviewed people who worked at the camp. And they, these children were being indoctrinated in Nazi ideology. See, they don't tell you that in this. But, uh, but it was, so when they, you know, when they talk about instruction in subjects similar to Boy Scouts, instruction in American history, and instruction in German language and singing of German songs, really that was an indoctrination into, uh, you know, the Nazi way of things, songs, and things of that nature. Sir? Did they raise the American flag? Say it. Did they raise the American flag? Absolutely. They raised three of them. They raised three of them. The American flag, the Nazi flag, and the German American moon flag. Absolutely. But the parents, uh, you know, they interviewed one parent, uh, you know, why do you go to these things? Like, hey, it's a good time. We get away from the hassle of the city, we relax. It's a good time, it's fun. You know, it's fun. How did they instruct American history? That's interesting. I, I could not begin to tell you what the instruction actually, you know, involved. But I'm sure it's probably not the same American history that your child would have learned, or my child would have learned. You know, because the whole, the whole, I guess the raison d'être, reason for being, is to indoctrinate and to bring uh, a Nazi way of life to the United States. Now, these folks never envisioned themselves as as having a. Nazi government. They knew that was something like that would never happen in the United States. But they can get close to it in terms of indoctrinating Nazi uh, perspectives and uh, cultural values and hatred of people and things of this nature. Uh, you know, if you were one of these folks, you, you wouldn't think anything was wrong with it because this is what you'd be used to. You wouldn't have an outside view of things. So we have Camp Hindenburg. And uh, I just threw in some photos I thought you'd be very interested in seeing. We have Camp Nordland. You see the word Arbeit, work. Arbeit, not fray, you all know that, that term, right? Work, work will set you free. We have Camp Siegfried. With the Nazi salute, they, they even have uh, <laughs> look, look, look at the way they cut the grass there. My goodness. All in the United States of America. Camp Bergwald, and you can see the American flag, the Nazi flag. Okay. Okay, so we were talking about Father Charles Codlin. Uh, Anti-Semite extraordinaire. I was surprised to find out he died in 79. I, mean, I thought this was like a, a guy that died like in the 50s or something, you know? I was really surprised. And they're both from the Cotton. So, upwards, he was the Howard Stern of his day, if you're familiar with the reference. Uh, actually, uh, I think the, the most Howard Stern ever got was 20 million listeners. He had 30 million listeners in, back in the day. And he published uh, a magazine, Social Justice. Um, and that Social Justice magazine was everything you could possibly want to put into an anti-Semitic magazine and more. Um, can you believe he received more mail than President Roosevelt? Um, you know, it goes back to that question, you know, who supports people that have this, these perspectives? And he was, I mean, more, more male than President Roosevelt. And you got to wonder, I mean, what are people thinking or what are they believing? I mean, it's just very, very peculiar. Okay, in the days and weeks after Crystal Knock, Coughlin defended the state-sponsored violence of the Nazi regime, regime he explained to his listeners, you could have heard this on the radio, November 20th, 1938. Unbelievable. The communistic government 
The Lenins and the Trotskys, atheistic Jews, had murdered more than 20 million Christians and had stolen $40 billion of Christian property. So not only are you worried about Nazis now, Nazis in America, you got to worry about your own Americans who are turning Christians against Jews. Why is this important? Because he, put, they, he partnered up with the German American boom. You can find his books and his social justice magazine in the bookstore of the German-American boom. How crazy is that? Um, and this is something that he wrote. This is one of his works. Um, and I just put it up there because it's, he's so obsessed with the Jew, Jew, Jew. Well, he's pointing out all of the Russians in the communist country that are Jew. He wrote this. This is his work, his book. Okay? Be it emphasized that these Jews were not religious Jews, they were the haters of God, the haters of religion. Uh, non Jews married to Jewesses. Uh, my purpose is to contribute a worthwhile suggestion to eradicate from this world its mania for persecution, yet he's creating a work that is bound to incite persecution. Persecution is an injustice wherever it exists. But yet, he says, simply as a student of history, I am endeavoring to analyze the reason for the growth of the idea in the minds of the Nazi party that communism and Judaism are too closely interwoven for the national health of Germany. So, it doesn't make any sense. You know, on the one hand, he proclaims that he's against the hatred, but the whole book is about hatred. He's taking the time to point out who's Jewish, who's married to Jewish women. He also reprinted, or allowed to be reprinted, the, um, the Elders of Zion in 1938, which is, if you remember, what uh, Ford had done back in the 1920s. So he, he continued that. Father Cotton. Now this is from, um, if you read history, you know that William Manchester is considered one of the greats in terms of history. And he writes this, Father Coughlin gave the Nazi salute and said, quote, when we get through oh, with the Jews in America, they'll think the treatment they received in Germany was nothing. That is Father Coughlin. Yes, sir. I'm curious about your personal opinion about the ability of people in this country to buy Nazi memorabilia, including boot material, from public auction sites like eBay? Um, I would have to say that, in my opinion, it has to do with the use of the material. If you are, like, I would like to consider myself a historian of some, of, at some level. And so if I'm buying, uh, you know, uh, an old edition of Mein Kampf, it's because I want to add that to my collection of historical items for the purpose of studying the history of it. But if I'm using it to worship it, like many, you know, there are people that do that. I mean, you know, in Europe, in many countries, that stuff is, it's against the law to purchase that stuff. In the United States, once again, it's like anything else. You have to take the good with the bad. If you've got the freedom for one thing, you have to accept that there are freedoms for other things. No, I don't understand. Are you saying that eBay should be allowed, should be allowing that material to be auctioned or not? I'm saying people should be allowed to buy it because that is what we, we are in the United States. We have certain freedoms and we are given we are given the freedom to purchase things off of eBay or Amazon or whatever. What I'm saying is, in the final analysis, it's what you do with those items. I mean, if I'm a gun collector and I want to buy a Colt 45, you know, from 1885 because I'm a gun collector and I want to hang it up, shouldn't be a problem with that. But if I want to take it and shoot up a school with it, then there's a problem with it. So I think it's ultimately what the intent is. You know, it's just like in the, with the law, you know, I teach law. It's just like with the law. Ultimately, like, first degree murder, as an example. You have to prove intent. Nothing else matters unless you can prove it. If you can't prove that that person intended on doing something, 
then you don't have a case for first degree murder. You may have a case for some other type of murder, but you need intent. First degree. What's well, the same thing here? But that's not practical. You don't know why. So whatever I say uh, is, you're going to find something else to no, contradict no, 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 no. You asked my opinion. I gave you my opinion. But, but I'm it's practical you. for me. <laughs> but, but you know, the seller doesn't know who the buyers are. They don't do a what did they CV on them. They don't know. But uh, that's not the question you asked me. You asked me, should people in the United States have the right to buy off of eBay? That was the question you asked me, not about whether or not the buyer knows or the seller knows who bought it. My, my answer is, yes, you should be allowed to, and you have to hope that the intent is the right intent. But if you start taking away people's rights to, to buy things pretty soon, pretty soon people, you know, certain people are not going to be allowed to uh, have uh, Netflix or whatever it might be. I mean, where does it stop after a while? You know, when you start taking away this right and that right, after a while, you know, what do you do? You know? I mean, I'll be honest with you. I have, I buy books on, uh, I buy books on Hitler all the time. I, I have a fascination with his personal life, so I buy books and I read about it. Not because I want to, you know, change anybody's opinion about Hitler. I personally, as a person who loves history, want to find out more about that particular topic. So to say that I can't buy Mein Kampf uh, because I might use it for uh, devilish purposes, I mean, where does that stop? You know, you, what are you going to use it for? What are you going to use? You, you know, you just have to put it out there and, and hope for the best. But I don't think you should be taking away the right to buy something simply because you interpret it as being evil or something that can't be put, put to good use. Yeah. I was interested to know what kind of people were followers of Father Conklin. Was it similar to the ways that Trump was Is it not? Well, I mean, I don't want uh, I don't want to make comparisons to you know anybody, anything going on today. But you know, if, if you were to ask followers of uh, Father Conklin, they would say that they are good, God-fearing people that believe in family and may not, in their own minds, be doing anything wrong whatsoever, you know? But they were listening to preaching against Jews and other groups of people, so yeah. they felt they were still being good Christians, even though they harbored and practiced terrible things against them. Well, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like anything, you know, everybody can rationalize anything in their mind. I mean, they may like, they may like 90% of what Father Cochran has to say, and reject the other 10%. You know, maybe he says some other things that hit them in the heart, and they reject the anti-Semitism. You know. The same thing as Reverend Wright. Same thing like that. That's right. Same kind of preaching. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you take what you can use. It's like it's like buying something from eBay. You take what you can use, and you don't use it for purposes. Well, it all depends on intent. Such as you buy a phone from uh, like from the at and store, do you intend to smash it, or do you intend to use it? Right. I can see I can see the analogy there. Uh, but, but once again, you know, I don't think people sit there. I mean, I to be honest with you, I don't think that uh, the Coon folks thought anything was you know. This is their mindset, and they may not say to themselves, we are evil, we are terrible, we are really, really bad people. But they don't think that way. Most people don't see themselves that way, and they may not see anything wrong with it. And they may say, you know, I, I don't really get into what Father Cobb is saying about the Jews, because I happen to have Jewish friends, and I don't really believe that. But this other stuff he's saying about love thy neighbor and all this stuff, that's good stuff. So we choose to reject what we don't like and keep what we, you know, what we like. Yeah, go ahead. What's appalling to me is that the Catholic Church let him go on like that because churches is black in their names. Because what? The Catholic Church let him go on right. and on, and they shouldn't have. Well, you know, once again, I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty. I mean, yeah. I know it's cliche yeah. to say it trite, but but it's it, it's true. I mean, it's I mean the. Uh, Pope Pius did nothing really to help in, uh, you know, the Jews during war. You know, we can go back and say we should have done this, they should have done that, but uh, you just look at it, you try to analyze it, see, you know, who was right, who was wrong, that type of thing. But the church is always so concerned about how people look at it, and certainly he was no advantage to that. Well, I mean, once again, you know, it's... We can sit here and analyze it, but I, I don't think people in general see themselves as being, you know, 
bad in any way. <laughs> yeah, or we're not Christian or whatever, not Muslim, whatever the case may be. I mean, people are who they are, and they accept what they accept, and they reject what they reject. I mean, if you grew up your whole life with your parents telling you that this set of people was no good, you would believe that, and it wouldn't be through any fault of your own. It's what you were told when you were growing up, and then you have to get older and learn for yourself. So they may not think they've done anything wrong, you know, by, by listening to Father Cobham. Okay, so the gold standard racket, once again, is the same, uh, same, there he is. As a matter of fact, uh, this picture, um, I like this photo because of this, well, you can't really see. If you look at the gentleman on the left with his head turned, I don't know what he was doing, but I like to say to myself, this is a guy who is rejecting what Father Coghlan was saying. He doesn't even want to listen to the guy. You know? Now, that may or may not be the case, but it's a nice way to perceive it, I suppose. That's the Social Justice Magazine. Um, that is uh, Ken, Joe Kennedy, President Kennedy's father, a banker, even though he wasn't Jewish. So you had all of these uh, organizations, the Christian Front, the National Union for Social Justice, and the German-American boom, and they were all in on this thing together. If you look over here, this is the Aryan Bookstore, German-American boom, Aryan Bookstore. And if you, I mean, look at some of those books. I mean, they have Mein Kampf up there, you know, all the things you'd expect. But if you look at the, towards the bottom, the truth about the protocols, and then further down, about four up from the bottom, social justice by Father Cogger. They were in it together. We're almost done with this thing. Okay, the foes. Well, Hollywood started to take a stand, kind of late, but they started to take a stand, and they made a, a movie in uh, 1942 or 43, I forget which one, I think 42, um, and they was, um, the Hollywood producers were sued by Fritz Kuhn because it was too close uh, for comfort. Fritz Kuhn filed a $5 million libel suit against Warner Brothers. You see, now the sound should be going on here. Ah, it's too big. But anyway, this guy sounds and acts just like Fritz Kuhn. If you see a film of Fritz Kuhn, it, it's... My goodness, I wish I knew why this sound was not working. We know he's that. Spewing anti-stuff. Spewing. That's a good word. Spewing. What happened? This is on. This thing is turned on. Yeah. No. Well, are there any other questions? I mean, it, it was not, there was just two or three more left, so. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You teach middle school in this Yeah. Okay, and they don't have any sense of history, because they don't have a century, but it's not good. Having said that, here you have a group of adults who do have a lot of sense of history. And, um, I watch this and I shiver thinking that it's happening again. Yes, right. um, it's a wonderful book. I don't know if you're familiar with it. They're teaching the Holocaust to small children by E. Bunty called The Terrible Thing. It's an allegory. Okay. And uh, it's about if you don't stand up for the person who's being persecuted, you're going to be next. And um, how these little animals in the woods talk, whatever. It's a lovely book if you want to introduce bullying or whatever. Um, having said that, when somebody says, if we don't stand up, if we don't fight like hell, we're not going to have a country anymore, and then there's an insurrection, or to ban Toby Morrison's book, or to uh, say that we're the, and, and lie about it, that we cannot teach uh, certain kinds of history in our schools, and the parents, and the parents should be deciding, not the people who are the educators. I mean, at what point are we, 
doing this over again, recreating history. I mean, 1984 is chilling with here. So, I mean, I just don't know where we get out of this, where we stop this good stuff. I grew up in New Jersey, and not far from Bernardsville and, and Mendham and places where there were meetings. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and I'm sure every generation probably has asked the same types of questions about things that happen you know, prior, where, where does it stop, and, and that type of thing. All you can do is enlighten and like Holocaust, um, when we have Remembrance Week or things of this nature at the schools, uh, some of the schools, not all the schools, and you know things like the, the library here, that the, what they have out there for the Holocaust Remembrance is just, just, just beautiful and it gets to really touches you. You know, for children to be able to see that, to be able to hear. Um, I'm a big fan of having, you know, I like primary documentation, so I like to have survivors, their primary documentation, speaking to the children. Um, if you affect them when they're young, it's just like these, these boom, you know, these children that go to the boom camps, I mean, if they go to these boom camps when they're, you know, five, six, seven years old, that's what they're going to be indoctrinated with. But if you get these kids when they're young and start doing these types of programs like what you have, it, it stays with them. It stays with I still remember to this day, I still remember programs that my grandparents took me to when I was just a little kid. Like I said, I was talking to you about the Neville. I still remember having satyrs there and, and things of that nature. Um, let me just say one quick thing because this went dead. So Fritz Kuhn uh, was found guilty of embezzling uh, funds from the boon, and uh, they could not get him. And he, you know, like with Al Capone, they couldn't get him for murdering people, so they got him on tax evasion. Well, it's the same type of thing here. They got him on embezzlement, and he ended up going to prison. Uh, and then uh, he was let out of prison. The boon itself dissolved December 7, 1941. The boon was dissolved. It didn't exist after that date, because that's, of course, the date that we uh, were attacked and we got into the war the next day. Uh, and he, he ended up dying uh, in 1951. And one of the last things he ever said was, who would have thought that it would end up this way? That was like one of his last lines to go out with. So, uh, yes sir. Oh wait, I'm sorry, somebody over here had their, yeah, go ahead and then I'll get to you. Go ahead. To kind of realize what she's saying there, uh, and I noticed you keep writing about the history so let's go back to history. Yeah. The American government, in its free speech mode, allowed the boom and all this other stuff to continue with very little repression. On the other hand, you have the Nazi, uh, not the Nazi, the uh, communists that were pursued in the 50s, the 60s. So how, I'm not a historian. You tell me when, when the whole, not, uh, pursuit of uh, anybody who was a communist stopped because I don't remember it happened. Meanwhile, the whole thing about the German clubs are still going on and they're still having their Oktoberfests and everything keeps going on and crowd boys are walking with Nazi flags. Well, I have no problem with Oktoberfest. Get some good beer. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is that when they try to go after Coup in, in uh, the late 1930s. It was uh, a congressional investigation of the German American boom and the communists in America. Now, for some reason or another, they let the boom investigate, uh, Kuhn investigation, and the boom investigation fall away, and they kept because you know if you know anything about the J. Edgar Hoover, this guy was I mean he was all about getting the communists you know, after the bank robbers. He was all get the communists. Um, you know, once again, yes, there are manifestations, but, but something like Oktoberfest, I think that, you know, that has to do with German culture. It doesn't really have to do with boom culture. You know, that's the thing about it. We, we can't, we can't, I mean, it's, you know, I, I, don't, I don't subscribe to the belief that all Germans are anti-Semitic. I just don't. I don't think it's true. I don't think any, all people are anti-Semitic. You have in every group, you have anti-Semites. Just like you have racists, 
and uh, you know, anti-women or whatever it is. Every group has their, their different sets of people, but you know, you take the group at large, and I think that you take what you can, the good stuff from the culture, and uh, the social aspects of it, and you just go with it. And otherwise, you, you, know, you live in fear, uh, you know, that person doesn't like me because I'm Jewish. That person doesn't like me because of this. That person. I mean, how can you live life that way? Being suspicious of a whole group of people. You just can't. You know, you got to. Yeah, go ahead. Just out of curiosity, how did you get into the Jewish community? Because I know that you had three so far. I have one tomorrow. Oh. We're going to have five classes coming through this week and one more um, next week. Is this elementary school? Or? Um, I have four fifth grade classes and four high school classes. Mm -hmm. school. A public school. Um, the gentleman had a, a question before. Thank you. Son reminded me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the army during the second year, did they volunteer? Did they turn down because they were lost? I don't think they claim it. There's no history about that. No. Uh, there were no history, but the fact that I didn't see any primary documentation that said that the military was not taking them uh, I don't think it's something that they would have, you know, generally, you know, made a big deal about. You know, I, I'm coming from the German American boom. Can I enlist? You know, it's not something they made public. I would think, but. I don't have an answer, but the fact that I didn't see anything indicating that they weren't accepted leads me to believe that they probably were. So they were drafted and sent to fight in Europe. They were American citizens. They're American citizen. I mean, unless I mean, yeah, I mean, because if you remember, for all their negative things, they still saw themselves as being Americans at some level, you know, and loyal. To the flag. So okay. I think it's 8:30. <laughs> and then in the end, the German American boom got boom boom boom. Bamboo's bamboo. That's right. Let's give them a hand. Right. Thank you very much.